Hi, everybody, and thanks so much for inviting me and getting a chance to watch this film again. I've seen it quite a few times, and it's inspiring every time. And it's great to see so many of you on this call. <clears throat> some of you are older than me and actually have some memories, <clears throat> contemporary memories of this civil rights movement. It still continues to inspire people, not just <clears throat> here in North America, but around the world. Uh, it's really remarkable how, <clears throat> how this film and how the civil rights movement inspires people even today. <clears throat> Some of the things have already been mentioned by you here. So I guess you know, often at our age, we do a lot of relearning <laughs> stuff we've we've known and we 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 learn truths uh and it's uh very i'll just go to some of these relearnings it's very important to be doing training uh many of us are like <clears throat> car engines we need tune-ups every six or six months or a year to improve our communication skills to improve our uh listening skills improve our ability to respond uh, effectively and wisely in nonviolent conflict, not just individually, but hopefully also with groups. Building community <clears throat> is so essential and building institutions that can uh, provide strong support for ongoing campaigns. Uh, the younger generation is uh, enthralled with social media that can mobilize millions of people in a very short time, but aren't necessarily set up to provide sustainable action for campaigns. And this sit-in was not just a one-off event, it was part of a campaign, first in Nashville and then other places. So we desperately need to be encouraging <clears throat> sustainable organizations, whether it's labor unions or or religious institutions and or other social institutions um, here and everywhere. Um, increasingly, uh, people are aware of the gender components uh, and gender analysis when it comes to nonviolent action. There's been a lot of research showing that particularly by Maria Stefan and Erica Chenoweth showing that at least in terms of maximalist campaigns, and that means not really the civil rights movement, but this is movements where people are taking on dictators and, and, and armies, um, that you need 3.5% of the population to often be a kind of a trigger point up, uh, upon which you can usually win a, win a campaign. Uh, if you have that kind of sustained involvement of 3.5% of the population. Um, this has come into some question recently and first in terms of recent years, people are wondering whether that still is still true. But the gender part of this is that women and girls obviously make up half the population of the planet and that we also see some from their research that when women are and girls are more substantially involved, that there's a higher percentage chance of, of success. And this is something that we need to communicate, particularly to young men who want to use their upper body strength to uh, fight police or fight the paramilitaries or whoever, uh, and with, with violence and with diversity of tactics often is used this phrase. And we have to remind young men that this is, in fact, not likely to maximize turnout and participation, which is really the key variable, and that it's actually a way for young men to dominate and take over a campaign and or a movement, uh, and that they need to be cognizant of, of the side effects of, of engaging in this kind of behavior on strategic reasons uh, and in terms of the impact this has on, on women leadership <clears throat> in movements. Um, uh, 
I'm reminded that one of the additional things that is so important in doing training and preparation and campaign building is to spend time thinking about what are the opponents going to do or likely to do? What are they thinking? And in this case, there are really two sets of opponents in the South that were, and we have this often around the world in various conflicts. We have the police or the authorities, and we have to know how they're gonna be likely to be responding and, and to ga game out those responses. And then also you have the paramilitaries and or actors that are not directly controlled by authorities uh, sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't, but kind of the paramilitary groups and how who they are and how they're going to likely respond. And so putting ourselves in the shoes of the oppressors, of the, of the opponents, of the adversaries is vitally important to do. And that's the whole idea of nonviolence is that we're not going to kill our way out of a conflict where everybody, including our adversaries, are included in the solution in the society that we want to create. And so we've got to spend time putting ourselves in their shoes, even if it's very uncomfortable com comfortable to do so. Um, I'll just conclude by saying I just got off the plane from Nepal, where we had a, a very unusual global gathering of nonviolent activists. <clears throat> it was put together by a new group called Solidarity 2020 and Beyond. This is a group that Nonviolence International sponsors. And they pulled together some of the most amazing activists, particularly from Latin America, Africa, and Asia, uh, across a whole range of movements. And it was just so inspiring, so incredibly inspiring. There's so many good people out there working on so many levels. Um, saw just one or two highlights in Mexico. There have been 115,000 disappearances in the last 10 years, which is extraordinary amount. And women in the country mm -hmm. have mobilized now to create search teams all over the country. They're not waiting for the government. So the government says, yeah, we're doing something. And they're not waiting for the government to research. They're going out onto private property, public property to try to find the the bones and the ashes and the remains of their children, find their children, and often at great risk. They've also instituted a mailbox, um, a mailbox in churches that even the priests can't get access to, where people can come and put the maps to where, uh, anonymously to where maybe their children are buried. In Colombia, uh, yes. No, in, I, I, in Colombia, um, we're reaching eight o'clock. In Colombia, uh, women uh, seized the paramilitary headquarters that was used for many years to torture and imprison the people, and has now turned it into a memory museum for those who have disappeared. Um, I don't know how much longer maybe we're supposed to end by now. So maybe I have to stop talking. There's so many things to say. So I'll stop for now. I hope that, I mean, there's so much more to say. I'll, I can answer questions too. <laughs> Any questions for, for Michael? Uh, 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 Richard, I, Richard. I, sorry, Arn. Uh, Arn has his hand up. Arn, oh. can you unmute? Arndt? Is your hand up on purpose, there, Arn? Uh, yes, it is, uh, and I've unmuted myself. Um, I mean, one of the things that occurs to occurs to me from from Michael's uh, 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 talk is uh, is. Uh, uh, that 
on the one hand, we need a community base, and it seems that there is not, uh, and, and this is sort of ties in with, uh, with uh, uh, the uh, uh, with uh, the Gandhi uh, uh, exploration that we had last uh, last week as well. Is that one thing that really made those successful? Is this strong community base? Uh, that that tied uh, tied people together and that made them willing to, uh, to to do these kinds of sacrifices, and I wonder to what extent the the extent to which uh, the sort of individualism of 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 uh, of um, uh, um, the current age, uh, especially in modern societies, uh, has really undermined the ability to 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 get people to make those kinds of sacrifices and to retain the kind of solidarity that uh, that made those kinds of uh, kinds of um, uh, efforts uh, possible. I think the role of the church in that regard is one, is again there's not really a, a real substitute for tying together communities, uh, and social media doesn't seem to seem to be able to provide that kind of a thing. Um, just a, just a thought that occurred to me. Any comment on that, uh, Michael? And just to say, Michael is, is silenced. Oh, Michael okay. is. Mike, uh, Michael has also put in the chat a Nonviolence International um, link. Link, so you can uh, find it more. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I, I thank you, Arndt, for raising this issue. In the Washington D.C. area, and I think in many places in developed world we're seeing a very large number of young people. I mean, very, very large percentage of young people who see themselves as secular and or non-theist, atheist uh, in some way and not affiliated with any religious group. And um, I worry about uh, these uh, folks as lone rangers, very isolated, particularly with our other ways of this social media can be isolating in a, in a kind of a funny way. Uh, ironic way. So I'm very much wanting some of the progressive uh, uh, denominations out there, the UUs, the Quakers, Ethical Society, um, the Reconstructionist uh, Jewish community, and others to be really making a big effort to try to build congregations of uh, folks that include and wel warmly welcome and receive non-theists, atheists, and many of these young people who don't, for whom the Godhead or theism doesn't, you know, work great for them. And we've, it's not the only institution to reach out to them, but it seems to me that the cross-generational institution of these religious congregations does provide a, 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 uh, a blueprint for other kinds of congregations or groupings that could help sustain our society. I, I do worry. I don't know if other people have any thoughts on this regard. I mean, obviously there are other potential ways to mobilize people in other institutions as well. Okay. We do have some comments from Joseph Clark and then Phyllis Creighton. So um, Joseph, go ahead. And I'm thinking that we're going to uh, not later than quarter after. That would be my understanding, but that gives us time for a couple more uh, questions so, or comments. So go ahead, Joseph Clark. If yes, you... I like what Michael said about um, the opposition or your opponent and trying to anticipate what they're, what they're going to do, but also respond in a compassionate way so that whatever you have to do to get your opponent onto your side that you don't alienate them at the same time so that you can't negotiate and then the other point i'd like to make is like how do you you know build consensus to sort of anticipate what the opposition is going to do and then create consensus about what the response will be and you know michael's talking about you know skills i'm just thinking my god it just seems so impossible to sort of have this very fluid event go on anticipate what the opposition is going to do, try to respond in a compassionate way, and then, then build consensus on what you're going to do to go forward. So it's it just requires a, a lot of skills. And I think our democracies are failing us because we're not taught those skills. We have to sort of teach them to ourselves. Mm -hmm. I would say that uh, the kind of nonviolent action they did in the civil rights movement should 
be the kind of action that we try to aspire to. In my estimation, the most successful nonviolent struggles tend to be those that are prefigurative, where people act out the future today. That's what the civil rights movement was doing to sit in at lunch counters, for example. They were acting out the future today. They were creating the future today. And those tend to be the most powerful um, kinds of actions. And we need to try to come up with some of these actions ourselves to address climate change or whatever. Not easy to do, to design them and to try to come up with them, um, but I would encourage people to try to aspire towards prefigurative actions if possible. We don't have a climate tax. So maybe if the city is that Toronto is not doing a climate tax, let's set up as Norway has done uh, by the government there uh, to set up toll booths all around uh, the, the periphery of Toronto and, and uh, collect uh, you know toll booth and collect, collect a carbon tax. Citizens collect the carbon tax for a while. Uh, we're, we, we need to be doing stuff when the government's not doing its job. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michael. On that example, Canada does have a carbon price and it's a rising carbon price to 170 a ton by, the, uh, by 2030, as long as we don't get derailed in the next election. So that is one thing that we have. Um, but I love the example of setting up a toll booth or setting up a dramatizing as um, as Martin Luther King was speaking about earlier in the film, uh, dramatizing the injustice and dramatizing, as you say, prefigurative what it should be. This is something that we need to um, to have greater justice. So go ahead, Phyllis. I just want to point out that the Raging Grannies have used humor and public appearance and the ability to get the press to report on what we've done in order to draw attention to things like Doug Ford's terrible greenbelt policy and his health policies. And we've been doing it for almost 30 years now. I don't know that it's a great contribution, but it's a creative idea. Yeah, arts. I don't know. Do you want to comment on arts and and song, Michael? She's he's my Michael is silenced. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, I I don't have much to add here. I mean, it would be really nice if we sang something here, but it's hard to sing on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, humor, raging grannies are great uh, on so many levels. And let's face it, with an older population now, all over the world, the demography of the world is changing. We have an older and older population everywhere in the world. Even the world where you have a lot of young people, you're still getting a lot more old people. And it's changing all societies. And we want to be encouraging raging grannies on steroids on, on lots of levels and older people to be mobilizing in the vast numbers that they have uh, are achieving. To, to help weigh in on, on social change. Thank you, um, Michael. We'll mention that we do have Seniors for Climate Action now um, in Ontario, organizing in Ontario. Uh, the third act is the Bill McKibben um, group that has actually got a day of action very soon. Like, is it tomorrow? I think it might be in the United States. Um, seniors taking action and in solidarity with the younger generations taking on the climate crisis. Okay, I see um, I see Paul and then I see Richard. And I think that that might be it if we're going to try and close up around quarter after. Does that sound good? Yeah. Um, okay, so Paul, go ahead and then Richard. If you can, that is to say, Paul, can you be unmuted? Yeah. Here we go. Uh, very quickly, one of the ways, somebody mentioned the individualism today with the social media. But the young people are very much concerned about their future with the climate and with war, like we're facing nuclear war. To me, I don't know, is it important to study where the, the movements that have failed? Extinction Rebellion failed. 
the students and the young people in Myanmar seem to have failed. The women in Iran, and they started with young women, but mobilizing women across the board, and some men may be successful. So studying the mistakes may be something that's worthwhile. Extinction Rebellion didn't work because it offended the motorists who are a majority, and it died out. The idea was good, but there again, as someone said, you have to put yourself in the shoes and get the other person on board. I don't know how to do that. Any ideas? Any thoughts on that, Michael? Yes, we constantly need to learn from our mistakes and to improve because the adversaries are also learning all the time. And um, I would just be careful to say that when you really look at the, from a social science standpoint, look at social change, <clears throat> short-term persuasion is not actually what usually brings change. It is a substantial amount of coercion uh, and force that nonviolent activists bring, even if they're coming in with very open-minded and, pr and persuasive kinds of appeals and approaches. But uh, that in fact, whether it's a boycotts in South Africa, you know, as you saw a few weeks ago, uh, there is an element of coercion and force that is actually in most cases, the short term uh, mechanism that makes for the change. I've talked about and introduced mechanisms for nonviolent action in my book that I've come out with recently where I've recategorized Gene Sharp's methods a little bit more broadly to include a bigger emphasis on these prefigurative and constructive kinds of approaches. Um, and uh, I'll put a link, it's a free download, put a free link in my uh, the chat here. I would welcome feedback from people about the universe of nonviolent tactics today and what's available. Um, but yes, Paul, good comments. Yeah, good comments, although I, I wouldn't say that Extinction Rebellion has failed or disappeared, I think they are rethinking their approaches. Um, so, but they're, they're definitely making climate an issue. Um, whether they're getting the change that's needed in, in, the, in the context of the UK, they're taking, I think, another look at their, at their strategies and how they can have more broad appeal. Um, we all, and like you, that's what you were saying is we have to learn from where we've had mistakes. We have to, to go forward. Over to you, Richard. Yes, I just wanted to say that uh, I think this campaign was absolutely brilliant. And uh, there's so many aspects, so many lessons to be learned from it. Uh, and, and certainly, you know, Michael and others have mentioned many of those. I'd like to focus on one that hasn't really been emphasized so far. And that's the brilliance in selecting the basic issue. If you go back to the, the, the first one with Gandhi. What he understood was that salt is something everyone needs. And it's so unjust that poor people should have to pay a tax on salt and they can make it themselves. In the second case, the lunch counter, desegregation. It was clearly uh, unfair that, that black people who were buying things in the store could not go to the lunch counter. Now, once, once the issue is discovered, it appears, you know, as though uh, it was obvious, but it wasn't obvious. Both Gandhi and, and uh, Jim Lawson, I think it was, had to actually discover the issue that they could dramatize. They did that so effectively. And then when the agility of being able to move from one tactic to another, which, which Michael referred to, and it's so important, moving from, you know, the, the sit-ins to the boycott and then to the incredibly well-organized march from the university to the city hall where the mayor had to meet them. And uh, that, that was absolutely brilliant the way that, that was orchestrated. What, what could the mayor say under those circumstances? He was absolutely, um, you know, he didn't have any, 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 any leeway. He couldn't um, say that it was a moral thing to, to, to prevent blacks from you know, joining the lunch counter. So it just strikes me that 
the brilliance of, of, of leadership, the organization, the, the planning was um, amazing. And this, this documentary in only 25 minutes gave us the whole, whole outline so clearly. I, I was just so impressed by this, by this uh, documentary, by the discussion. Thank you. Um, thanks, Richard. And, uh, and Richard's part of our nonviolence group and Science for Peace Nonviolence Group is an open group. So if you're interested, uh, follow up with us um, about becoming part of our, our regular meetings. And uh, I wanted to take a minute to, to thank uh, Michael. Michael and I know each other from quite some time ago, working on the Indonesia project of Peace Brigades International. And um, it's wonderful to see you again. And uh, thank you for sharing your book download and sharing your wisdom with us tonight. Um, really, um, <laughs> really appreciate that. So I think it's uh, Jorge is going to pull us together for a closing. Is that is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So thanks, Lynn, for the your uh, very uh, skillful uh, facilitation of the of the conversation. I, I think. Uh, we have learned a lot tonight, uh, at least myself. Uh, I, I didn't, I hadn't seen this documentary, and it's really very exciting to see that. It, it, you know, although it's so so, so many years ago, but uh, I think we we it's important for us to to see successes of that kind to inspire us today. Um, I want to invite everyone.